Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's not the morning. So I'm bound to say good morning. I usually go to bed pretty late. Um, welcome to base. So we've got, it almost feels weird getting back to normal. So I can see people's faces for the most part. That's great. If anybody wants to mask up or anything like that, of course, that's totally reasonable. Um, the university isn't requiring any of that. So apparently we're full blown face to face, everything business as usual. I will point out the obvious. So it's now fall and school has just started up and people are gonna get sick. So that always happens. So there's always an epidemiological rise in sickness when school starts up. So the more we get together, the more that happens. Um, if there is an emergency or something like that, I think we're gonna be well prepared. So we'll be able to pivot. My intention is to run class fully in person, but we'll have online resources. Most of you just noticed I set up a camera on the back of class. So I will be recording all of the lectures and I should have those up in a reasonable amount of time before the next class is what I'll aim for. During the pandemic, I ran home as fast as possible to put everything up. I'm not gonna rush quite as fast this time, but it should be reasonable. The intent is for review. That's what I'm mostly hoping that the, the online sessions are for, the stuff on YouTube. I'll walk you through that in a minute. If you need to go to a conference or something like that, you can use those as well. If you do rely entirely on the YouTube videos for class, probably you won't do as well in class. So that's my experience. There is a dip there. I think we've all experienced that. So you can't interact, you can't hear people's questions. And so use it judiciously, use it as you need, but try to show up to class. I think it's a lot better environment. Uh, we will be doing review sessions as well. There'll be office hours, my TA should show up in a little bit and I'll introduce you and he should be doing a Zoom um, review session as well. So we'll try to get through all of that in the next day or two. I also want to tell you what Bayes is and approximately what we're going to be studying. Uh, I do have a mini presentation for you on Bayesian statistics. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I don't want to just do the syllabus today, so I'm just going to go through the very basics, show you where things are, and we can talk about all the little minutia next time. Uh, I also have an email for you that's going to be coming out in a few hours. So let me just walk you through that, type this up for you this morning. Um, you can't see what that says, I guess, so let me try to make that bigger. That's approximately right. So again, I'm gonna send this to you right after we're done with class, so you'll have all of this, but these are just some of our resources. I see lights. Who has the light switch? Do I have it? Oh, it's here, Ah, thank you. Cool. You're high. So turn off the ones up front, just for a moment. Perfect. That's good. Okay, you're hired. You've done the job. Whoever sits back there. I will also point out I have a camera in the very back, and I'll be moving that middle desk. If you come in late, just try not to trip over it. So it's expensive. It'll shut down that resource. So that's my personal camera. Um, there's a web page that I'm going to direct you to. We'll look at that in just a moment. Um, but you can just click on this thing and it'll pull it up for you. So we'll be using that as our primary resource for the class. If you've taken my classes before, it's business as usual. Everything is the same. We will not be using Canvas. So I will have all the assignments and everything posted to the web page. So when we take a midterm and you want to know where you're at in terms of the grades, I'll be showing you and sharing with you the grade distribution, and then you can impute yourself and figure out where you are, and I'll tell you what it all means as well. So we're not there yet. Um, so web page, we'll check that out in a couple minutes. There is a syllabus, we'll check that out as well. That's on the web page. So I'm putting that in just for redundancy. There's a Slack page that we'll be utilizing, and the Slack page will have two main purposes. It'll be for review session questions, so that I can prepare for you. And so all I ask is that you try to have the questions up five minutes before we start review session, if you're so inclined to attend those. They'll be in the evening at about 5.30, and we'll need to create a spot on the schedule for that. 
We won't do that this time, we'll do it next time. So make sure you have your calendars next time in all of your time constraints. We'll make this work. Um, the Slack page will also be there for just questions as they appear throughout the semester. So it might be a logistical questions. Um, and I'm gonna ask our GTA to handle those questions. And if you can't handle them, then you can hand them off to me and I'll try to handle them. But you guys can also handle them as well. And so it's an open forum for discussion. And so you can ask questions like, when is the midterm, but it's gonna be on the syllabus. Or you could just ask basic questions. Or you could set up study sessions. So there'll be a couple different links there. Let's click on this real quick and see what we get. It's not click ready yet. or something similar to it. If you haven't, this is a new resource for you. It's not the way we want to conduct business all of the time, but it can be helpful. Um, so it's brought me to review session questions. So when we do pick the review session, you're, you might be saying, I've got a problem with um, homework problem 5.3. What you might add to that, instead of just saying homework problem 5.3, you might say what your problem is or your misunderstanding to the problem or which part of the problem. But if you just say problem 5.3, I will address it, I will answer it for you, but it's not a constructive question. And so it would be more helpful to know where you're struggling with the problem. And so adding a sentence or two would be helpful. So if you guys all just write the whole homework session in there, we'll have to have this conversation, I'm guessing. <laughs> so that's not the goal. Uh, and then there'll be just general stuff so if you have any general questions you can stick it there i think review session is primarily where i'm going to be looking most of the time okay so back to the email so slack resources you should have gotten an email from me this morning did anybody get that yes slack invite okay so what you're going to do then and this is this is not atypical is you're going to click on this link and log into the class I've allowed anybody with a VT email address to do it, so you need to be signed in through your VT email address on Gmail, so because it's all um, attached to Gmail. So if you're having trouble getting in, I can already tell you what the problem is. You're not signed into your Gmail account, so do that first. Okay. In the very last, um, if you can't, if nothing is working, I can always send you a personalized invite. So come up to me at the end of class and say, I just can't get this thing working. And I'll send you a personalized invite. Also, any of you that are in the class and have access to everything, you can also send your friend the personalized invite. That'll all work. So I don't think any of this is top secret. So if you want your friends in other classes to see what your questions are, that's okay with me. No problem. Okay, Zoom, I hope not to use Zoom. I really can't stand it. I don't get anything out of it. It really bums me out every time somebody calls for a Zoom meeting. So we'll use this if we need to. So it's gonna be a static link. If you guys do wanna use that link outside of when I use it, I think it's okay. Uh, no problem if you're doing study groups, but you can always set up your own Zoom links. Um, I'm not sure exactly when we'll use Zoom. I just thought it was prudent maybe to put it on the list and be prepared for something. Obviously, if we need to pivot, and move to a, a different modality, we will be using some Zoom for that. I won't be um, recording the review sessions because they're just answers to homework questions and making that persistent is a problem for obvious reasons. Um, but if we do need to periodically, if somebody's out of town, namely me, I might use Zoom for review session or something like that. We'll use it as we need. I might ask UERTA to set up a review office hour through Zoom. So I'm gonna ask him what he prefers. So that might be his modality for that. And then recorded lectures can be found on this link right here. So let's pull that up. It's called the Lehman Lectures. If you can't find this, go to Google 
and type in my last name and append lecture, and it'll take you to this web page. These are all my lectures for the last several years, including this class. I think this will be my third recorded session of this class. So if you want a head start on what's coming up, you can look at approximately whatever the date is last year, shifted over the one day, and we should be about following that same schedule. So it would, it would be unlikely that we follow it precisely, so it's all approximate. So if you do want to review things ahead of time and see approximately what the lecture is, um, you can click on those links. So let's just look at an example. So if you go to 921, click on that. Nicely, I filled out what the description of the class is. Again, welcome back, everybody. So no surprise, a little thing today with uh, the rain. So there's the idea. I think it's exactly this classroom. <laughs> so unfortunately, they erased the X transpose X inverse, X transpose, Y, so you guys are gonna have to remember that yourselves. I assure you that will come up in class. If you need me to put it back up there, I can do it. So, there will be in-class midterm and final no notes, but if you can't remember that, you're probably in trouble. So, it's the solution to the normal equations. Okay, so you can have a, a rough look at what we're doing in class just by scrolling through these. These will be persistent. Um, we also have a web page. It looks like this. And so you will click on this link, Courses Taught. I'll be sending you the link to this, but if you need to know, it's apps.stat.vt.edu slash my last name, link. So easy web page to remember. I'll write that down. Everybody always forgets to append apps right there. And sometimes people, when they're used to navigating Unix directory, directories, they'll put a tilde there. No tilde and an apps. So this is going to be your resource, Bayesian statistics. You probably can't see that either. I'll leave these up at the end of my teaching so that people can see what I've taught, what the materials, what the schedule looks like. So this is your link, 5444 Bayesian statistics. And we'll be going through all of this next time. So basic structure of the class, this essentially says you're gonna learn Bayes. You're gonna learn methodological, theoretical backgrounds in Bayesian statistics, but you're also gonna learn about computation. So it just kind of has a rough outline of what we're gonna be covering. Philosophy, what is probability in the first place, some of the debates that occur in probability and inference. We're gonna be talking about something called the likelihood principle and other principles and how Bayesians use it. Um, basic constructs, likelihoods, priors, and posteriors. That's the whole name of the game. And then there's some more tidbits in here, more specifics. If you want a better idea of what we're gonna be doing, you can click on schedule. This is my schedule from last year. I'm gonna be screenshotting this and including the screenshot in an updated schedule. I left this up here so that those of you that like to get ahead can go here and download everything. So all the papers, look at all the homework problems. So all the homework that I make for this class, I, I custom construct those problems. So they're not gonna be coming out of the book. Um, the book is Peter Hoff's book on Bayesian statistics, but the reality is, is there's about 17 really good books on Bayesian statistics. And a lot of these people will focus on one aspect, whether or not it's the decision theory, the sequential updating, the computation. Some people will build their books all around R. And I like all that stuff. And so I'm gonna be providing you a new set of lectures that aren't coming straight from the book. And it's gonna be basically my progression of Bayes the way I see it. There are a lot of differences in the way people will teach Bayes, but ultimately, we're all doing the same thing. It's all likelihood times prior. I'm gonna be trying to teach you about decision theory. 
I'm going to be trying to teach you a contrast between classical statistics, what classicists do, and what Bayesians do. That'll be coming up. I'll be trying to teach you about computation <coughs> and sequential updating, all the different layers of Bayes. They're all good. If you read through um, Peter Hoff's book, he, in the very beginning, the introduction, um, says Bayes is really a sequential updating paradigm as opposed to a decision theoretic paradigm. That's incorrect. So there's a whole book on decision theory for Bayes. Christian Robert would be rather upset reading Peter Hoff's comment. So what Peter Hoff means is he's only going to focus on the non-decision theoretic stuff. We're going to be doing both. I thought that Peter Hoff's book was the most modern book, the easiest one to read, and so it's really just a resource. If we're covering a topic in class, you might want to just flip to your index, look up that section in the book, and read along. So he will have different perspectives than I'll have. I'll bring in a stack of books, and you can look through them next time if you'd like. So, so I recommend the book. Um, it's not absolutely necessary. There's one excerpt from a book that I do use in a homework problem, and I'll be printing that out for you. OK, so you can look at this. Um, there's a paper we're going to read soon. You can click on that if you want to get ahead. This is going to be our homework zero. And it's titled, When Did Bayesian Inference Become Bayesian? And so the question is, is when did we start calling this thing Bayesian statistics? And the paper discusses this for 30 pages. So there's a homework one. I guess I called it a homework zero. And it pertains to this. You can start looking through this. Keep in mind, all the dates are from last year. I'm going to be wiping this out and starting over in a couple days. So if you do like this resource and you want to download everything, I'll do it soon. So here will be homework zero. It basically says construct a likelihood curve and plot the posterior and compute the posterior expectation. If you don't know what an expectation is, you're in the wrong class. So you're already expected to know things like normal distributions, binomial distributions, so on and so forth, and know how to compute variances and expectations and higher order moments. I know that a lot of you will need a lot of review in this class as well, so we will be filling in all the gaps. But we're not starting from ground zero. So if this problem is hard right here where I say compute the posterior expectation, that's this down here, and this blows your mind, Think about a different class. So this is just a discrete setup. And then I think I ask at the very top of this is who coined the term Bayesian? So let me just read exactly what did I say. So read when did Bayesian inference become Bayesian? Who originally coined the term Bayesian? And who was the founder of Bayesian statistics? So two relatively straightforward questions. But obviously not so straightforward because Steven Stigler, or is that right? No, Steve Feinberg wrote this paper. Steve Feinberg decided it took 30 pages to answer these questions. So there's a lot of names that he's floating around. And I won't be able to tell if you just randomly pick three names. So every name in that paper had something to do with the construction of base. I think that there's three good answers to who coined the term Bayesian? Does anybody have a guess? Or want to throw it out there? Bayes. You don't have to be right. Bayes. Yeah, maybe Bayes, right? Let's see if that's true. So it obviously can't be that easy, right? <laughs> so Bayes is a reasonable first guess without knowing what actually happened. So hopefully I can fill in some gaps. Anyway, that's how you're going to navigate everything. So again, I'm going to be wiping this out, and we'll be starting with just a couple points. This paper, a screenshot of everything so you can see about the tentative schedule, so on and so forth. Any um, extra resources, I'll upload to Slack. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I make an error, and I'll correct it over Slack. Um, sometimes I want you to look at something like on a Wikipedia page, and I'll upload that to Slack. Any questions?
just so we can say we looked at the syllabus. Here it is. We've got a bunch of stuff to fill in. On the logistics, you know where you're at, you're at already, so we're in good shape there. You know who I am. I'm Scotland Lehman. You can call me any permutation of anything that has to do with my name, and that'll be fine. Um, final exam dates, I don't get to choose these. These are chosen through the bursar's office. And so when you go to the class timetable, there's always a code for every class. I don't know if you guys know that. And it tells us when the final exam is. This is when ours is. It's Monday, and it's at 745. <laughs> so it is what it is. I've tried to change this before. It doesn't work. So we will have a two-hour final exam that morning. So um, I can be inclined to bring coffee for you. Okay? So, <laughs> I know I'll need a couple times. Uh, midterm, we're gonna need to fill this in. So I'm not sure when we want our midterm exactly. Usually I have it at the end of October. Last year I had it on October 27th. So I want you guys to look at your calendars right around that area and check to see when your conflicts are. If you have a conference coming up, something like that. Because I would like everybody here for the midterm. Um, We'll schedule that next time. Once we lock it in, that's what it's gonna be. We won't change it. So something to do next time, check your calendars. We're gonna have um, review sessions as well. I like to start these at 5.30 p.m. So because that's pretty early, but I can't be inclined to move that to six o'clock or something like that. I can't get a room before five o'clock is the trouble. Um, so really what we're looking for is do we want to do this on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? So I assume nobody wants a Saturday review session. The idea here is to just come in and ask questions. And we can be fully interactive. There's going to be moments where I don't want to go through every little detail of the calculus with every single one of you until you all understand it perfectly. That'll take up the whole class most of the time. And so what I'd like to do is leave that for a review session so they can go on anywhere between one hour, sometimes three hours, depending on how many questions you have. If you can't make it for the whole review session, you can leave halfway through. You can leave after 10 minutes. You can leave after your question is answered. You can hang out and do homework in the back and just kind of be involved in the discussion. So again, it's just my time with you where we can go over anything you want. So whether or not be the history, Minor details about linear algebra that you don't know. You can have a math lesson. Um, of course, the more involved the lesson is, the more I have to think about it. And so that's what we're using the Slack review channel for, is you can at least let me know what you want to know about. Um, our teaching assistant is going to be UEE. I've asked him to show up today, so you'll get an introduction to him. Prerequisites for the class, I expect that you've had a probability class. So probability is not brand new. You know what expectations are. You know how to work with multivariate random variables. You know how to work with them in discrete and continuous settings. Uh, one is a sum sign and one is an integration sign. They essentially mean the same thing. So not too much of a difference there. I do understand that putting it all together, maybe you've had experience in all the different things, you haven't seen it for a while, and you haven't put it all together yet. So this could still be the class for you. Computing, um, you can use anything you want. I would advocate using something with graphing facilities. So if you want to use assembler, that's fine, but it's going to make your life a disaster. I recommend MATLAB for this class. I'm going to use MATLAB for all of my demos, but they're pretty similar to each other. And some of those demos I'll be giving to you. And so you can check the, the web page. Also, there's some demos on there, .m files. I'll be walking you through those. Um, our book is listed here, Peter Hoff, 2009. Again, this is more of a reference point. So it's a pretty easy read but he doesn't go over the whole horizon of days the way I see it. So I think you need other tools as well. But it is a good book. Um, your grading breakdown is gonna be, there's a midterm, there's a final, and then there's all of your homework and projects. 
So some of your homeworks are computational exercises, doing MCMCs, things like that. Markov chain Monte Carlo, for those of you that are initiated. Um, that'll all be part of your homework. Hopefully everybody's getting about 30% right here. And so it's really those. I typically will allow some makeup for the midterm. So we'll go over that as need be. There'll be extra credit problems also that I'll introduce to you if you do need extra credit. So there's a lot of pathways to an A. So if you have a terrible day and you're doing all the assignments and you're doing extra credit and you just mess up on one problem, it shouldn't destroy your grade. So again, there's lots of pathways to an A. Academic honesty is essentially says, and I don't think there's a whole lot of opportunity to cheat in this class, but it basically says, if you think you're cheating, you are. So if it even crosses your mind for a second, you can read through that. Um, anyway, there is an office to handle such um, academic crimes at BT. I've never used it in this class. And so you will have projects. You're allowed to work together. Just do your own work. So, and I encourage you guys to work together. But if you're turning in carbon copies of homeworks, I'm going to see it. So, and usually when I see it, is it's usually one of the worst homeworks in the class. And those are the ones that always get copied. So, it's some blatant errors or something like that. So, if you are going to somebody and you're desperate, make sure you choose the right people. It's <laughs> what people that can actually help you instead of just saying, well, just write it down. So, anyway. Um, hopefully that's not a problem. If you think that your homework or something has been graded incorrectly, just come and see me. And we'll work it out. So if you look at your homework and your, your partner's homework is one point higher than yours, you got a 98, they got a 99, I would encourage you not to bother me about that because it won't make any difference in your grade. I know that there are people that, hey, you're .3 off of an A, so you get an A minus. You know, that's what it is. I don't do that. So if you're close and you're in the same cluster as other people getting the same grade, I'll give you the nudge. And if I give somebody the nudge for some reason and they leapfrog somebody else in their overall grade, I'll take the other person up as well. So everything is done in your favor. I'll walk you through a little bit more of that once we get through a few graded assignments. Anyway, this isn't supposed to be overly um, authoritative, the class structure. So again, lots of exercises and pathways to A's in this class. Any questions? You guys want to hear about A's? What it actually is? Let's do that. I think I've given this presentation a number of times, so if you've seen it, just bear with me. We'll get into new stuff soon. Again, stay tuned for that email. It'll have all those resources for you. Okay, very brief introduction to Bayesian statistics. I'm Scotland. That's my first name. The university has me down as Scott Double T. If you do call me Scott, it will irritate me, but I won't tell you. But if you use a second T, I'm going to wonder what's wrong with you. <laughs> so, because my name doesn't have that. The trouble is, is once you put, once somebody logs your name into a database, you're stuck. So people with weird names. They have five different versions of their names, but they really only have one. Uh, my last name is Lena. Uh, you can pronounce that in any number of ways as well. I'm not sure my parents even know how to pronounce it right. Um, you can give me the, the typical courtesies, doctor, professor, anything like that, but I don't care about that either. Uh, you can even mix this up if you get confused. If you're from a different country and you don't know which name is first or second, you can call me Dr. Scott or Mr. Scotland, or something like that. Just extend me the same courtesy, because I don't always know which way people use their names. And if it bothers you, let me know, and I'll make a correction. Okay. So, Bayesian statistics, let's just get start, started. So it's based off of the theorem. I think we all know the theorem, Bayes' theorem. It shows us how to swap conditional statements. And it's a true probability statement. We'll see that in a, in a moment. Um, 
Basically, Bayesian statistics is all about likelihood functions, so we'll have to figure out what those are. They have something to do with sampling distributions, but they're not the same thing. Um, there's a prior, and both of those things together, multiplied together, make a posterior distribution. So you superimpose those two things. So it's compromised between what the data is telling you, assuming you know the function that generated the data, which is a bit of a fiction in itself, and also a constraining function. A lot of people just call this the prior distribution, and if I could go back and rename everything, I wouldn't use that terminology. Because you can also express ignorance through this function. And so we never really care exactly what the prior is telling us. What we care is what the posterior inference is all about. And the prior can be used to induce different properties of your posterior. If you did have subjective beliefs, let's say you did another study, and you wanted to encode those beliefs into your new study, you could do that. And so you could express some state of knowledge. That's the subjective approach to doing Bayes. If we're thinking about properties of the posteriors, we're constructing priors. Um, so that it regularizes things in just the right way, you're called an objective Bayesian. I would change all of those names because I would say anytime you pick an objective constraint, you're acting subjectively. So you chose it. And so everything is subjective. That's true. So there's things that are compelling. So I would say there's no objectivity. <coughs> so the only thing that's objective is that everything is subjective to some degree. Some things are more convincing than other things. So I'll try to walk you through all of that. Um, and then we're going to be studying Monte Carlo procedures. So it used to be in my mind that we'd use this class and just talk about theoretical stuff, but that doesn't make any sense to me anymore. So you need to have the computation and what makes all this practical and how do modern day Bayesians go about business. So I'm going to be showing you both the whys, how you explain everything and the properties, but also the computation. So here I did a, a quick Google search on the term Bayesian. I did this a long time ago. So this is maybe 10 years ago. I, I did this um, query. And I was just looking at Google Trends, and this is what came up. So this is exactly what came up. Now there's a few artifacts here that I look at and I think, what's going on right there? Is it that the term Bayes is not being used as regularly? So what Google does is it looks through papers, manuscripts, anything in their corpus, and they look for dates that coincide with this term. And so when it first appeared on the internet, but that obviously, the internet wasn't around in 1760, and so they're looking at dates of papers. So, and they're looking at their headers and the metadata there. It's hard to know exactly what Google Trends does. I've tried to use it in research before and I've given up every single time. So it's wildly inconsistent exactly what it does. Also things like this. I don't think the term Bayes started getting used less and less in 2010. This is a smoothing effect that they have. It might also be their searching. So it has a harder time searching for new stuff than it does old stuff. I'm not sure exactly what the reason is. That's why I wouldn't use this data for research. But we do see a trend. So the term Bayes pops up a lot and coincides with around about 1760. You could check the exact date. Does anybody know what it is? 63. So, and then we see Bayes pop up again around 1920s. And then we see Bayes start to flurry right around 1940s. And it's kind of like of academic interest, it looks like. And then it becomes a widespread interest later on. So let's just analyze this a little bit. What happened here? Uh, Bayes' manuscript was published after he died. That's it. So Bayes' manuscript. So, and he had passed away before he had presented this to the world. 1920. Let's, uh, let's not do that one. Let's do this. What's happening in the world right around here? World War II. 
So we're ending World War II, people are talking again. So during World War II, I don't think people were expressing too much outside of the basic need to survive. Um, <coughs> So World War II is happening. So a lot of stuff happened in statistics, computer science, a lot of fields shifted right around there because there's a lot of migration going on, a sharing of ideas, a confluence of ideas. But I will tell you over in Bletchley Park, um, they were doing a lot of Bayesian statistics as well. So that was Alan Turing's group. Um, also along with Alan Turing was I.J. Good, who was a faculty member here for about 30 years. He died. Over a decade ago, he was 92 when he passed away. But he also worked in Hut 8 with Alan Turing, and they were doing a lot of Bayesian methods. And if you go back and you study what that group was doing, Simpson is in there, he's doing stuff with them. So a lot of names that you already know in statistics, they're already doing Bayes. And Jack told me a good story, that's Irving John Good, who goes by Jack, that he had gone to Turing several times and said, aren't what we doing actually Bayes? And I guess the conversation was something like, yes, it was. So there's something called the Turing Good model. It's a capture-recapture model. And it can be phrased in a fully Bayesian way. Um, people were not calling it Bayes back then. So that term had not quite arrived yet. Does anybody know what they were calling it? Uh, inverse probability. You're on fire. Yeah, inverse probability. So they're inverting a probability statement through Bayes' theorem. We'll look at what that means, what that looks like in just a couple minutes. So World War II happens. Bay starts getting some traction. People think that this is maybe a good idea. And then it starts ramping up. Why? Cold War? Cold War. Maybe. So I'm going to say this is computing. So computing starts happening and people start utilizing Bayesian ideas. I would say up until, you know, it's basically like in the 80s, I would say it's of academic interest. There are lots of good reasons to be a Bayesian, but actually carrying, carrying out the exercise was nearly impossible. And so Bayesians would argue on philosophical terms. And I don't think that helped people too much. It's like, ah, you got an answer, but so what? You did it all wrong. And then they say how you should do it, and then they say, but you can't. But that's what you should do. It wasn't very helpful. Um, there was already a lot of arguing as well. And I would say the argument strategy wasn't effective. We'll talk a little bit about that. So that's Bayes. In a nutshell, at least what happened through history, here's kind of just an evolutionary tree of Bayesian thinkers and people that contributed to Bayes. Of course, me being me, I can never talk about what something is before I talk about what it's not. So I need to have the contrast in there, and that's why there's some ardent non-Bayesians in my tree. So at the very top of the tree, I have Laplace, and you'll encounter him in this paper that you're gonna read. So Laplace understands the implications behind what Bayes knew. You'll notice that my tree is not rooted at Bayes. And the reason why is simply because Bayes knew the probability rule, but he was not utilizing it is how a Bayesian would. And so when you learn Bayes the first time in step 101, they say, let's compute, let's give you the probability of A given B, and then we'll have you compute the probability of B given A. And we'll call that Bayesian statistics. And I would say use Bayes' rule, but anybody would have done that. So that's what everybody does. That doesn't make you a Bayesian, per se. So Laplace started using it in what I would consider a modern Bayesian way. And he started advocating different priors. And so it's kind of interesting. He uses quite a few of the priors that we still use today. And he didn't quite have the rationale that we have today. It would be nice to know what Laplace was actually thinking about. I would say the left-hand side of the tree are um, non-Bayesians, for the most part. And these are figures that are going to be coming up through discussion because they're the ones that were arguing against Bayes. I'll point out one prominent figure, Fisher. He was an ardent non-Bayesian, 
He denied he was doing beige, but he was being accused of doing it regularly. And so he had an argument called uh, a branch of statistics that he was naming fiducial statistics. And there's been a number of papers written to try to clarify what Fisher was doing. And I've seen papers so recently as in the last decade that come out and they're trying to frame the correct fiducial argument. I'm going to tell you the correct fiducial argument, Bayes. Just, it's already there. So anyway, Fisher, although he said a lot of things that are disparaging to Bayesians today, he did correct himself later on. And a lot of people forget that. It's not as dramatic when people go, I guess we agree. Nobody ever wants to hear that. Yeah. Nobody ever wants to tell that story. They want to hear the dramatic part. And so we'll tell both parts of that story. There's also a lot of Bayesians. So I would say at the very top, Bruno De Finetti was a probabilist. And he was showing all of the minutia through a mathematical lens um, the advantages to being a Bayes Bayesian. Jeffries was a physicist, and he needed something so that his analyses had some form of objectivity attached to them. And I'll tell you what he was after a little bit later. That comes up in about three weeks. Um, Savage, Lindley, and I.J. Good, they were all there for the conversation. And I'll give you another little heads up. In terms of who constructed the term phase, it's probably on that box. And there's probably a lot of discussion as to who gets credit for it. But the paper does tell you in some hidden paragraph exactly what the conversation looked like. So try to find that. And then later on, MCMC is born. Mark off Jane Monte Carlo. It's the stuff that makes beige useful. It's what everybody does. There are other approaches, computational approaches, and we'll touch on them. But for the most part, we'll study MCMC in this class. There are variational techniques that are a lot faster, but they're approximate. And so that's always the trade-off. You can trade speed for an approximation. The question is, is, is it worth it? And in a lot of cases, it, it is worth it. And in many cases, these things can be used together. I think this is a good time. So you come stand up. So this is Yui Yi. He's going to be grading for us this semester. Thank you for coming in. And his email address is on the web page. So if you have any questions about homework grading, you can reach out directly. But Yui's going to be responsible for the grading. I'm going to sit down with Yui before he grades so that we're all on the same page and go through some assignments and some grading. What I'm going to ask Yui to do is schedule one hour of office hours a week for you guys. So if you have any questions. Yui, do you want to do that in person or over Zoom? Zoom will be a better option. That's what I was thinking. So Yui's going to send out to you guys, or at least manage this however he thinks best, what a good one hour block for Zoom would be. I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. So, but other than that, um, if you ever see Yui around and you've got questions, he's a super nice guy, he's brilliant, and so, and he's one of the best explainers in the department. So you guys are in great hands. I hand selected him myself. You any comments? Um, I'm a third year PhD student in stats department, and uh, nice to meet you all. I think Dr. Lemon chose me because I didn't score high in his class <laughs> last year. <laughs> he wants me to learn it again. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> it's not true, <laughs> but I meant what I said the first time. But there's the added benefit that he gets to learn things just a little bit better. So just keep in mind, we're all students here, so some of us make mistakes, and sometimes it takes us a minute to figure out what's going to explain things. So myself included. Anyway, you thanks so much. I'll be asking you about that one hour time slot, so be thinking about it a little bit. Okay. And then um, I will also include you on the email that I send out to the class, so you can see all the resources. But it's going to be a lot easier for you to do things. <laughs> Cool. Any questions for you? Cool. Thank you. That's it. Perfect. Okay. So a lot of people have worked on Bayes. Let me show you Bayes' theorem. It's this thing right here. Probability of A given B. And that's what this says. 
This will help you to understand whether or not you're in the right class. So I will just um, make a little bit of annotation here. This means the probability of the set A given B. So probability A happens, whatever that event is, given B happens. So if B happens, what's the probability A happens? So it's a sequential set. And so and that's why Peter Hoff says that Bayes is a sequential set. So it's talking about given something's already happened, what do you think? The probability of something else will happen. And how do you compute that? That formula on the right hand side. And so I'm just going to rewrite that a little bit. This is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by, and I've written it out a little bit funny, it's the probability of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given the opposite of A, A complement, times the probability of A complement. So ultimately that says the probability of B, regardless of what happens. So either A is going to happen or A is not going to happen. And so this is marginalizing over both those things. This is the probability of B down in the denominator. Now let me just ask, does anybody not understand this formula? Or is it clear? I'll be stoked if everybody just understands Bayes' theorem. And it's conceptually, yeah, what else would it be? I'll give you guys a moment. We can come back around to this next time. Anybody at all confused as to why that's an equal sign? So let's talk about it a little bit more next time. So I'll try to make it intuitive for you. There are a few things to think about in this. If this was a continuous set right here and I were driving this thing down towards something very, very small, and the probability compared to everything else would be so tiny that we would call it probability zero. I don't mean it's impossible. Things with probability zero happen all the time. So it just means compared to everything else, it's very, very, unlikely to occur. So and we call that a zero. So if this thing is going down towards zero, something in the top must be going towards zero as well. And so there is a, a limiting version of all of this where we're not dealing with actual probabilities, but we're dealing with densities. So in this formula, without changing anything, if I change it to density statements instead of probabilities, it lends itself right over. So it's true in both cases. Um, how Bayesian uses this is like that, right here. Now, I have a notational um, problem already. This is not the way we normally write things down, or at least not the way I would normally write things down. But a Bayesian isn't the only one to use Bayes' theorem. They use it in a very specific way, and that's written right here. So I'm assuming in my notation theta is continuous. So instead of the sum sign, I have an integration sign right there. So it's the continuous analog to adding things up. Um, the issue that I'm having right here is the way we're using the symbol bar. And so this is supposed to mean given. So the bar is usually mean given something. But that's not the way we're using it here. So. Um, I need to clarify this. This usually spooks people at first. There's nothing more to understand than what is the notation expressed. And sometimes you'll see people write this down. The reason I wrote this down this way, right here, is that it looks like that same probability statement in the upstairs. So they look like they're the same things, where I just changed the sum to an integration. And ultimately, the denominator right here is going to be a constant with respect to theta, 
We think about what a Bayesian's doing, of assigning a probability statement to theta itself. And in the denominator, since we're marginalizing over theta, there's no thetas there, and the data is fixed that you start with. So that's going to be the marginal probability of the data. I'll have an experiment for you so you can actually see all of this in practice next time. But ultimately, let's just come back next time and talk about what this equation means, and let's look at an example and see what a Bayesian approximately does. So the name of the game is Bayesian sees the data, they know what the generating function looks like, but they don't know the parameters inside of that function. So what they're going to use is Bayes' theorem to flip everything around, and provided the data, they're going to give you a probabilistic assessment of what all of the unknowns are. This is actually unlimited. A Bayesian will do this to anything. Anything they don't know, they'll use Bayes' theorem, invert the probability statement, and try to assign probabilities to the things that they have not observed and condition on the things that they have observed. So I need to walk you through this, tell you about the notation I normally use, what I don't like about the notation that's on the board, and all of the different variants of this notation that you'll see floating around the literature. The nice thing is, is we all mean the exact same thing. And if we all set up the equations exactly right, we'd be doing the exact same thing. But how we express it notationally is sometimes different. So let's pick up with that next time, finish up the syllabus, and then stay tuned for that email. And if you'd like to rewind and watch some videos, the YouTube is already up and available for you. Thanks, you guys. If you have any questions about logistics or getting into class or something like that, let me pack up and then I'll meet you outside of class. Thank you.